Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, some of some of the viewers were, might be a little bit uh, kind of wondering what had happened, which is okay. People are just going to start popping in. I just pinged everyone here, low. So let's uh, let me just ping. Okay. Yeah. And let's see. And probably you are, you already know this, Bryson, but uh, this is going to be recorded. This is going to be available for uh, for viewing for further viewing at a later time at uh, everyone else's convenience. So uh, anyway, but uh, I really uh, apologize for the delay, and uh, I don't. We, we were kind of figuring out what had happened, but we're officially starting the um, today's. Uh, broadcast with Bryson Payne and Bryson is an author of Teach Your Kids to Code uh, and he's also a professor of computer science at the University of North Georgia and Bryson I'm gonna um, pass on the mic to you and I'm gonna let you do the honors and the introduction so please audience let's welcome uh, Bryson Payne uh, and let, let's uh, have him introduce himself. And uh, Bryson, it's all yours. Thank you, Carlos. I appreciate it. Can everybody hear me all right? Uh, yeah, you can be, yeah. Very everything's good. perfect. Yeah, everything's perfect. Very good. Well, I'm going to switch over to share my. Carlos, are you able to see that all right? Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, sorry. So, uh, <laughs> Just making sure that our uh, technology is going good on both sides. Well, thank you again for having me. Uh, I am Dr. Bryson Payne. I'm the author of Teach Your Kids to Code. I'm also a computer science professor here at the University of North Georgia, like Carlos mentioned. And it's a pleasure to be on Dojo Live today. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, one other thing, we just came out with a new course, Teach Your Kids to Code on Udemy.com. It's got 101 lectures, uh, about seven hours of video all together. We started just a little over two and a half months ago, and we got 2,200 students enrolled at Udemy. I'll give a link here in just a moment. I've been teaching computer science for the past 17 years. More importantly for today's topic, I'm also the father of two coders, ages five and seven. My sons, Max and Alex, used to sit on my lap when I was grading projects at home, and uh, they would come up with cool ways for me to make my programs more interesting for my students and more interesting for them, and uh, they're really the inspiration for uh, this book and how I got it started. What I want to talk with everybody today about is why and how to teach coding to kids. I want everybody to be able to see some short, interactive, visual programs to engage children and adults and then code Turtle Graphics in Python together. And we'll see how we could even build on some advanced programming concepts using Turtle Graphics as a foundation. So one of the first questions I get from people is how do we explain what coding is to kids? Well, kids pretty much already know this, but uh, coding is just telling a computer what to do. What they may not realize is that code is everywhere these days in every new gadget from little robots to miniature flying drones, self-driving cars out on the road, our watches, toys, 3D printers, your cell phone or tablet, all of those are running code. We also call code apps or software. And why should kids learn to code? Well, first of all, uh, the first reason is easiest. Coding really is fun. When a kid gets to code their own apps and games, uh, I've been programming for about 30 years, and I still love coming up with my own apps and my own games. Second, coding is a valuable job skill. We know that there are great jobs out there in the market for people who have the skill to solve problems using technology. And then finally, coding can be a creative outlet. Kids are actively participating in creating apps when they code. Imagine a world where every kid could solve problems using technology, building their own mobile apps, writing their own code to drive a toy, a car, a drone. There are just limitless possibilities when kids learn how to code. A question that I get pretty often, I speak at middle schools, elementary schools, high schools, and colleges um, around the Southeast here. 
And one question I get is how young can we start teaching kids how to code? How can, how can we, how young can we start teaching kids uh, some basic computer competence? And I, I see in the research that primarily we need to focus before middle school, no later than grades six through eight. Um, current research is showing that ninth graders have already self-selected out of STEM careers. Over half of boys and over 80% of girls have decided by ninth grade that they do not want to pursue a career in science, technology, engineering, or math. Uh, there are very few elementary and middle schools that teach any coding. Even most high schools don't offer a coding class yet. So coding for now has to start at home or in an after-school program, a coding club. That's really why I wrote my book, Teach Your Kids to Code. Well, I used Python when I was working with my own kids because it was quick, it was easy, it's fun, um, very easy to read, and it's a really powerful language. It runs on any platform, PC, Mac, Linux, Raspberry Pi, Android, and um, it's used at companies like Google, Amazon. If you write Amazon Web Services, you can write in the language Python. It's used at IBM and in colleges, of course, um, around the world. There are tons of libraries for games, networking, and more, and best of all, it's free. You can download it at no cost at python.org. Just to give you a visual of where we started when I started coding with my sons, I started when they were two and four years old, and I started with really simple visual graphics like the ones you see on the screen here. With Python, we have a module called Turtle Graphics that actually goes back a long way in, in uh, computer programming history, almost uh, 40 years that we've been programming graphics in Turtle. And uh, the great news is it's really easy to get started coding graphics like that in Python. And if I may, I'm going to take you through just a couple of examples. I'll show you some code and some of the graphics that go along with them. Oh, please. Absolutely. Be our great. guest. Okay. Well, for people who want to get started at home, you can download Python. And we're up to version 3.5 now. Just pick any Python 3 version. You can pick it for Mac, PC, Linux, Raspberry Pi. There are actually over 20 platforms that are available for, uh, for Python. And then you can test Python with a simple line of code. You can print hello world. That's our favorite way to get started in a new programming language, right? So we uh, like to start out just to make sure that we've got access to Python and we can run programs. Once you have that up and running, you can write a short five line program that draws an interesting visual on the screen and I'm going to switch screens over just for a second, and I'm going to try some Python. We'll make sure that the technology works and we're able to share it. And uh, there we go. You can see me again for just a second. I'm going oh, yeah. to share my screen, and we will show some live Python. Perfect. Uh, let me re just remind the audience uh, uh, that uh, in case you have any questions, there, you should be able to see a Q&A prompt and a Q&A window right there on your on your screen, and where you can simply um, uh, type in your answer, uh, your question, and um, we'll either read it out uh, and just pretty much talk about uh, your, the answer and whatever is available, and also. Uh, let me remind you that we are on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, you already, uh, all the, the links have been shared via Twitter, so you can interact with us through uh, social media as well. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Bryson, back to you. Thank you. Great. Are you able to see the screen all right there? Yes. Great. Perfect. All right. Well, I've got just a simple five-line or six-line program in this case that just imports this turtle graphics. Oh, and I... I wanted to mention a, a good friend of mine, Al Swigert, who's another author uh, who works with um, uh, No Starch Press, my publisher. He's actually just come out with a Spanish language plugin for um, Python. It's a library he calls Tortuga. Of course, it's the turtle graphics with uh, all Spanish commands instead of forward, um, left, right. You actually can use la derecha, and it's a really cool deal. Uh, to be able to uh, use, he's actually working on multiple languages of implementation so that you can uh, program in other languages as well. 
But I'll show you just simple turtle graphics using Python today. Just these few lines of code when I run this, you'll be able to see how it draws visually on the screen really quickly. Just a small square spiral. And just by making a few changes to this, we can make this bigger, smaller. If I make just one change at a time and give it a run, you'll be able to see how small changes to the program make a big difference in the way the program draws on the screen. And of course, my sons, when they saw this, they really liked it, but they said, well, Daddy, can it do other shapes besides a square? And so I got the chance to let them type in, even when my two-year-old was just barely able to uh, find his number keys, I said, well, instead of turning left 90 degrees, let's turn left 60 degrees. Then when we save that and run it, you see a very different shape on the screen. So one great thing about Python's turtle graphics is that we can make small changes to the code and then immediately see the results just by running it again. And what I liked about working with this with my sons, Alex and Max, was that they were able to see those results quickly. They were excited. They had fun. Um, you can type in regular commands or the pen colors. Any of the HTML safe colors will work here. So when they wanted red, we just type in R-E-D and I'd show them where to type it. They were able to find the keys on the keyboard and all of a sudden they've got red. They can change the background color. We've got lots of things that we can do with turtle graphics. And uh, you can see just a couple of small changes give us a very different appearance. If I go to a slightly steeper angle, we'll make sharper turns around the outside. And if you've got kids who are a little bit older, you can explain to them what these angles are doing. Here, in this case, I'm turning left 120 degrees. Well, it only takes three turns to go 360 degrees. So I wind up drawing a nice triangle. And this uh, fact that I'm drawing a little bit further, I'm running my X from one to 100, and I'm moving forward that number of pixels every time, I'm able to draw a bigger and bigger shape every time, so I get spirals that look different. Well, if I try with uh, 90 degrees again, we'll go back to a square spiral. So this is making four 90 degree left turns, so it winds up looking like a square. Well, it turns out if we change this by just a little bit, instead of changing it to 120 degrees or 60 degrees, we're gonna turn left almost 90 degrees. We could do 89 degrees. And the great thing about turtle graphics in Python is they were able to get a difference immediately. The visual that you get from making just small Bryson, are you still with us? We seem to be um, uh, we seem to be experiencing a couple of glitches with the connectivity. Uh, so these go beyond these are beyond our, our reach. So we apologize deeply for that. Uh, so look, we're just gonna wait, going to wait for uh, Bryson's uh, uh, confirmation on whether we are, let's see, whether we are on track. So it's probably going to be a couple of, couple of few minutes or a few seconds before we get this figured out. Anyway, uh, I'll take advantage of this little um, lapse in communication to remind the audience that you can be part of the conversation. And it's a, <clears throat> the way you do it is just simply there, you should, if you're watching us on YouTube, you should be able to see um, um, a link to click right on the lower left-hand side. Uh, you should see, you should be able to see a link where you can simply click, and it'll take you to a prompt where you can uh, just leave your questions, type them, and we'll they'll appear on our screen, and we can read them 
I can either read them myself or Bryson's can, Bryson can read them himself and they, he will uh, answer them right here on the spot, okay? So, well, with that being said, let's see if we have uh, Bryson back. Uh, are you there? Do we have you back? Okay, we're still a little bit, a little bit uns uncertain as to whether he's completely back or not. Okay, let's see. Hello, Bryson, do we have you back? <laughs> well, this is the thing with uh, technology. Sometimes it's a little bit unpredictable and capricious, so to speak. So, hey, hey well, it seems that, that there you I go. Think you got back in. Sorry about yeah. that. No, that's okay. We were just, uh, I was just telling the yes. audience that uh, sometimes technology is a little bit unpredictable and there are many variables. Everything's far from completely perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we are we connecting from across a couple of time zones. So, thanks absolutely, for, absolutely. for, for uh, understanding. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, go. Let, let's go back to you. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, no problem at all. Uh, were you able to see up to uh, the uh, graphics there where we were changing yes. it to a few different spirals? Good. All right. Yes. I just wanted to make sure that we were through up till then. Okay, well, I'm sure. going to uh, show you just a few more examples of things that uh, we were able to do with my kids, and then I want to take a few questions. Carlos, uh, please do pause me if you get a couple of good questions. I'm glad to take one live here. Absolutely. I'll be more than happy to. Right. All right, I'm going to share my screen just one more time here. There we go. Excellent. Well, you saw what we could do with the square there. The, just a really simple change to this program. We could turn 90 degrees to 60 degrees to 120. And all you have to do is make small adjustments every time. And you wind up building something really complex with just about 10 lines of code. You can see this nice hex spiral imports the turtle library. The turtle library in Python is what lets us do all these really cool pen-based graphics. We draw with a colorful imaginary turtle on the screen. And all we're doing is telling that turtle to move forward, to change the width of the pen, to turn left or right, pick up new colors. And uh, here you can see we're using red, purple, green, blue, yellow, orange. So uh, my sons knew a little bit about uh, primary and secondary colors and the rainbow before they even went to uh, the kindergarten. Um, you can see we're able to do really rich visual things really easily using Python's turtle graphics. Um, it's a lot more accessible than most of the other programming languages that we use in higher education. I teach in Java. Well, we teach around a dozen languages total at the university. But Python is one that we use uh, for uh, both some beginner courses and when we're teaching advanced concepts like artificial intelligence. Just 10 lines of code can build something as beautiful and visually rich as the spiral that you see on the screen there. Okay. And then we get a chance to learn about, well, we can do variables. We could set up a variable called sides that lets us choose how many sides to show. If we make four, we'll see a square shape. If we turn it to six, then all we're doing is using that number of sides, that variable throughout our program. So instead of changing it uh, manually to 90 degrees, 60 degrees for four or six sides, we just divide that 360 degree turn by the number of sides. And then we give it a nice twist by adding one extra degree to it. After we learn about variables, we move on to learning about loops. We see how we can draw um, these shapes using just simple loops. And really, from the very beginning, the very first example in the book, you get to use a loop. But uh, when we dig in on how to use loops and how to predict how many times this thing is going to draw a circle, we learn more about how Python handles loops and how loops work in programming in general. And the greatest thing that I found was that I just let my kids come up with ideas to make the programs better. So I would draw a black and white shape on the screen and my sons would say, well, Daddy, can you make it red and yellow and can there be two of them? Can we make 30 circles, 20 circles? Can I let it ask me how many circles to make? 
And all of those are really easy to do. This is an interactive program that asks the users how many circles they want to draw from, uh, you can guess, you can pick a number, um, actually any number of circles in this one, but if they put 30, it'll draw 30 circles in a rosette. If they put 100, it'll draw 100. Then one of the next things that I saw was they, they really wanted to click and interact with the screen. And the great news is that Turtle in Python allows you to handle screen clicks. So we can call a set position or a go to function for the uh, Turtle's cursor. And as it moves around the screen, it draws. This winds up looking a lot like an etch a sketch or a, a little drawing pad. And so with just a little bit of interaction, this, this program is only a few lines long. Uh, you can see it's only about seven lines of actual code plus a comment up at the top. But kids are able to pick their own colors. They're able to pick how thick the turtle pin should be on the screen. And they're able to see the results really quickly, which was a lot of fun for my kids. Um, person, uh, I have yeah. a... I was wondering if we, if we can just pause for one second because I have sure. a couple of questions here. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Great. The, um, the first question that we have is was asked by uh, Steve Pearson, and he's asking. Um, he's. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna read them back to you, and then you can sure. simply respond. Okay. That sounds great. He, he says, um, "I asked uh, this question before with you on, on, on Twitter, Bryson, and if you if you learned Python." Could I use it with the CASP, CASP, and other security fields? Well, uh, there are a lot of, we do use uh, Python a lot in security because it is really fast and easy to write a script in Python. In fact, uh, my uh, colleague over at No Starch Press, Al Swigert, wrote a book called, uh, give me one quick second, Automate sure. the Boring Stuff with Python. It's a really cool book. He shows how to do things like uh, structuring files in a directory all the way through some simple security applications, which is really cool as well. But uh, Python is really, uh, it's not just user friendly, it's really flexible. There are toolkits out there for security. There are toolkits out there for uh, flying. Well, I mentioned, uh, you know, we've got the ability to program little drones now. So even toolkits for uh, flying little toys like this or programming your own, uh, uh, maneuvers, some really cool things that are possible with Python. I think it's a great one if you're doing anything security related, uh, but I think Python's a great first language or a great next language for a software professional or kids alike. Okay, there you go. Uh, Steve, I hope that answered your question. Feel free to let us know if you still have more. And um, just one more before we continue. This is from, uh, actually, he's one of my uh, fellow co-workers here at Nearsoft. He's okay. Osvaldo, Osvaldo Herrera, and he's uh, Osvaldo Herrera. Osvaldo is asking, most of the time, most of the times boys are more interested in programming than girls. Have you thought in what to do in order to make coding more attractive for girls? I think that's quite an interesting question. Bryson, back to you. Well, uh, Carlos, that's a great question. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I advocate starting younger with kids. Uh, we find that uh, girls by that ninth grade year have self-selected out of science and technology careers at a much higher rate than boys. But we don't have really good data on why girls are saying they don't want to go into a science, technology, engineering, or mathematics field. And that includes health professions. That includes uh, anything in the sciences or research. And those are alarming numbers to think that eight out of 10 young women by ninth grade have uh, either experienced something or not experienced something with regard to technology, science, or math that's causing them to say they're not even interested in studying science or uh, math in the future. Uh, so that's one reason for starting younger. Uh, some of the things that I've done in my uh, programming here at the university and in the book uh, and working with kids from elementary school to middle schools and high schools is uh, I try to do a lot more visual programming. I do that for myself anyway, but uh, I found that uh, I have a program actually that I'll share up next if it's all right. Let me, uh, let me switch screens over just for a second and show you some of the examples. 
Uh, sometimes it's as simple as um, thinking about the entire audience, boys, girls, younger and older, while I'm programming applications or while I'm writing examples to use as exercises, um, either in the online course or on the book or in my real classes or when I'm speaking um, in a school. I like to uh, think about flowers, think about fireworks, things about think about things that excite the guys that uh, draw in the girls and uh, just open it up and show them that they can do something creative. I think a lot of kids miss the fact that you can, um, you can really create, you can uh, draw, you can implement, you can solve problems, you can connect with people. There are a lot more things um, that we can do with technology like coding that, uh, that aren't necessarily just building an app uh, that you might use at the office. They're not just building a video game, although those are great things that you can do with coding. It's uh, really the, um, the variety of things that you can do. Uh, if you think about how technology connects us today, we're able to connect, well, like this, <laughs> for this webinar by video. We're able to connect with our friends in Facebook. We're able to talk with one another in ways that we've never been able to do in history before. Um, so I think uh, just helping kids see that there are more things than what we think of as coding uh, that are possible when we learn how to solve problems using computers and uh, learning to code. Okay, there you go, Oswaldo. I hope that answered your question. And uh, okay, how are we how are we doing with the presentation? Because we still have two more questions. Uh, I don't know if sure. we can yeah, pause or can we read? Yeah, let's take another question or two, and then I'll swap okay. back over. Excellent, great. Okay, here's another question. Actually, he's not uh, his question is right here. It's not here in the prompt. Uh, he's uh, actually I, I gotta say that he's my my kid. He's not a kid. Aww. He's 25, but oh, uh, I, I got him. Yeah, I got him. <laughs> Here on, on on Facebook Messenger, and he's getting his feet wet on programming. Uh, and, and but he's kind of wondering uh, what if you can explain to him. He he's a newbie, so if you can explain just what Turtle is, he will appreciate it. Oh sure. Well, Turtle is goes back actually to uh, the late 1960s, early 70s. It's been over 40 years that we've had Turtle graphics. Uh, we had a programming language called Logo that came out way back in the early days. Uh, excuse me, Bryson. I'm sorry. You broke up. You froze for about three oh, seconds. Okay. So we lost you for three seconds. Can you can you uh, yeah, go back I can again? Step back three okay. seconds there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Logo goes back a long way. Logo was a programming language that was developed for education back uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, and we uh, we actually get our Turtle graphics from that Logo programming language. Uh, they we're trying to find ways to engage students, to engage younger learners, people in school, in programming. And the Turtle Graphics Library was just one way that uh, that educators used. And so Turtle goes back that far. Uh, we've been using it for over 40 years to educate kids, to um, engage visual learners in programming. And that's really what Turtle is. It's a visual approach to programming. It gives you the ability to make small changes to a program and see those draw live on the screen while you watch. And you can change something up and uh, swap things out. It's really cool. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it, and so does he. <laughs> well, I hope you'll give it a try. Turtle is a great way to uh, get introduced to Python specifically, but it teaches you everything you need to know about more advanced programming languages as well. The okay. concepts that you learn about variables, loops, functions, you carry forward to Java, to C++. There's no limit. Okay, excellent. So let, what do you say we, we do one more? Because we have, we have several more questions, but let's do one more and then we'll carry on. That sounds great. Okay, okay, now I have here one another question by Selene Arzola. Selene is wondering, uh, well, he says, she says, hello, Bryson, maybe it's, it's a silly question. I don't think it's silly, but here, here you go. Maybe it's a silly question, but why did you choose Python for your program teach your kids go to code? Why did you choose that particular one? Well, I, I tell you, the reason was pretty simple. Uh, when my sons would come up with a cool idea and they would say, Daddy, can, I, I actually teach Java for, uh, for most of my courses. So my sons would sit on my lap and they'd see me do something visual with my students in Java. And Java is just a little more, okay, a lot more complex as a programming language. It's uh, definitely not as quick to pick up as Python. And so my sons would say, well, Daddy, can you make that circle red? 
Can you make it move on the screen? Can you make it bounce? Could I click on it and make it pop? And all of those were great ideas. And in Java, by the time I would code it, my kids would get bored and run off and do something else. <laughs> so I found if I did everything in Python, I could code right there with them on the screen. And I could say, well, here, type in R E D. And they type in red and poof, the screen would be red. And so uh, really it was just uh, out of necessity. I needed something that was easy enough to read, easy enough to write, uh, that my sons could make changes and actually see them live on the screen. And uh, like I said, as soon as they could uh, find the number keys on the keyboard or their letters, they were able to type those things in and see it. And Python makes that really short, clean, and easy. To write a program in Java would require more than five lines to make it look really cool. Okay. Hey, well, there you go, Selena. So I hope that answered your question. Okay, we're going to stop here for uh, for a little while, and so we can go back to Bryson's presentation. So, uh, and then we'll save uh, all the other questions that we have for a little bit later throughout the show. So, Bryson, That's let's go back to you. Yeah, we'll pop back to some more great questions. These were good questions all around. Well. Uh, one thing I mentioned was uh, when I'm working with uh, students this summer in our honors program here at the university, we had a lot of, uh, we actually had uh, more female students than male students in the class. So I was trying to think of some fun examples that were a little more, I don't know, just a little more colorful and interesting uh, since we had a large number of uh, female participants in the honors program. And one of those was this click flowers example. And uh, I think I'm, I'm going to try one more time to share a little bit of uh, my screen when I run this program because to see it in operation is really cool. I'll show you just a quick setup. This one is a little bit longer. So by this point, um, either in the course or in the book, students have learned how to draw, create their own function. So we've created a function called draw flower that will draw a flower at a certain X and Y location on the screen. And we're using just regular coordinates like you would see in a geometry or algebra class. And uh, when they click on the screen, they're able to see one of these flowers draw live. So I'm going to switch over, and I'm going to share a turtle screen and uh, see if we can get a nice piece of code working for you. Yeah, click flowers is a nice one. There we go. Good, and I'll share my full screen with you guys so you can see it. Okay. All right. You able to see the screen there, Carlos? Is that coming all right? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. okay. I mean, I'm look. I'm, I can see your um, your image okay. very clearly, but uh, I don't see I this try your screen. One more time. You try entire screen and share. There we go. All right. Okay. I think that came through. Is that better? Yeah, that's uh, now I can see you. I mean, Very I can see your, your screen. Thank you. So th this code gets a little bit longer. So this is usually after I've worked with students through a few examples. But the great thing is you can type these in and try them even before you understand everything that it's doing. This is using some random colors. So we're getting some uh, other libraries involved here. So students are learning to use lots of different pieces of things. And when I run this, you'll be able to see that I'm actually drawing by clicking around the screen. You able to see the animation all right there? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. All right. Well, that's really the uh, one of the cool things that we've done with uh, students. I've used this program from elementary through high school, and uh, boys, girls alike really enjoy being able to draw. After a while, they come up with cool things that they can draw out of the spirals. So they'll run this, and then they'll do things like make a smiley face or draw lots of different shapes around the screen. They'll see if they can click so fast that they can throw the program off. And the cool thing is we've written the program so that it goes back in and fills in behind it. And so they're able to do some fun things. And um, it's kind of deceptive how easy this is because uh, you look back here and we're handling on-screen clicks. So we're handling user-driven events. We're writing a function that uses some X and Y coordinates. So we're mixing a little bit of math, a little bit of uh, technology, and a whole lot of color, just a lot of artistic fun. 
So those are some of the kinds of things that we do that uh, engage students. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen and move back here. Good. All right. There we go. And uh, I'll go ahead and swap back to just a couple more slides in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. So that gives you an idea of some of the things that we do both in the uh, book and the online course. We've got um, lots of new functions that we can create based on these same concepts. So we can build something even more beautiful, more complex. We can bring in different color modules so that they see how to use functions that aren't uh, just a part of the basic turtle package. They're using a lot more of Python. And I call this one Click Flowers Bright. All of these, by the way, are up on my website at teachyourkidstocode.com. You can download every sample for that we've talked about today for free. Um, all you have to do is click through to the downloads page and you can pick up every single one of these. You can download uh, Python for free also from python.org and I've got it linked there. Just a few tips for parents and learners of any age. Uh, I always tell my students to explore. Change the code, make it do new things. I tell them to make the code their own. If you're a parent or if you're a teacher, uh, something great that you can do is code together. Get kids working together, work together with your children. Um, create an after-school coding club. Um, anything to get kids participating and sharing. Um, it's a great way to get people involved and to, um, I've seen kids group together in teams of three and they compete to see who can create the coolest shape, create the coolest program, who can work the farthest ahead in the book. It's really a lot of fun to see kids get competitive and enjoying something that uses technology. And uh, what I tell my students in class all the way through the online course and the book is try every example. See what your kids enjoy, see which examples you find more interesting and do more of those. Um, once again, you can find all those source code files um, at teachyourkidstocode.com. It's a long website name, but uh, it's easy to remember. And you can find some information on the Udemy course there as well. Uh, one of the cool things that I got to do as part of the Udemy course was work with my sons. So this is my son, Alex, on the screen there. He's uh, He came up with a really cool idea. He said, well, instead of drawing all the circles the same color, could we make it a rainbow? as you go around this, this set of circles for this rosette? I said, well, of course, let's do this. And so a couple of lines of coding, and I think uh, about seven minutes into this video, we draw something like this. And you can see he's enjoying it, I'm loving it. Uh, it's something that you can do together with your kids. And um, it's good for both of you. We can all learn more problem-solving skills ourselves, and to teach that to our kids is a lot of fun. One other thing that I tell parents is to use uh, if your kids are more hands-on, if they want to see a little robot do something, if they want to see a flying drone, there are lots of examples out there of technologies that you can buy for under $100. Uh, Sphero and Ollie are these little uh, rolling robots. We've got the Parrot Mini Drone in the set of hands there, the little blue flying quadcopter. Um, there are apps out there for programming both of those. You can also use Python toolkits that you can find out on GitHub. Uh, there are some Edison Lego compatible robots that you can get for $49. Canny bots for $60 just came out on Kickstarter. And those are both directly programmable in Python. So the simple things that you're able to program in Python turtle graphics, now you can make a little robot move around in a square, move around in a hexagon or draw circles. And if you do need a resource, I do have a book out there. Uh, we just came out in May. We're already in a second printing. Uh, there's been a lot of good response, and I've gotten some good feedback on Teach Your Kids to Code. It's a uh, top 10 bestseller. It was a number one new release on uh, Amazon. It's at Barnes & Noble all over North America, and you can find more out about it at teachyourkidstocode.com. We've also got the Udemy course if you uh, prefer to watch video. In fact, I set up a coupon code for today for our uh, viewers, Carlos. Well, they can use Live 20 and they'll get the $49 course for just $20. So they get 60% off. They use this coupon code DOJOLIVE20. So DOJOLIVE20, you'll get the entire course. It's about seven hours of video all together, 101 video lessons. They're all two to six minute lessons for the most part. So it's short chunks and you can pick up anytime you have 15 minutes to spend in front of the computer. Um, whether your child is five years old or 25 years old, uh, or whether you're learning to program either in a new language or learning to pick up a new career. 
And just a few last thoughts. Uh, I tell people just to enjoy technology with their kids. And we have to remember to do that in moderation. Consider having a tech-free day every week. Uh, it can be tough at first. We used to have what we called no iPad day. And my younger son, Max, called it the worst day in the universe the first few times we did it. Uh, for older kids, it might just be a tech-free evening. So don't, uh, don't use the cell phone, the, the tablet, the computer for just one night. Uh, pick a night that doesn't interfere with homework, of course. But the most important thing is to start coding. Um, code together and get started as soon as possible. Today's a great day to start. And let me go back to a few questions from you guys. Oh, absolutely. And actually, we, we still have some. And by the way, there you have, there you have it, guys, well, especially you guys at Nearsoft. That, that's a good way to redeem your Amazon gift cards that you get, hey, your hard, you hard-earned uh, Amazon gift cards that you get as, a, as rewards for your, all your efforts here at Nearsoft. <laughs> and, okay. So we still have, let's see, um, we have, let me, let me just put on you know, my, my eyes back on. Okay. Here you go. Mm, we have another question by Selene Arzola. Let me just select it. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> um, she's, uh, she's asking. Well, he, she thinks it's out of topic, maybe. So you, I'll let you be the judge. Which are your recommendations as made a profession when you face to learning a new language programming? Oh boy, uh, as a professional, how to pick up a new programming language. I think some of the same guidelines that we use with kids still apply. Find something that you're interested in. For my college students, I tell them if they're interested in mobile app programming, then think of a mobile app that they wish they had. Uh, for some students, that may be a shopping app so they don't always forget to buy something at Walmart. Uh, for other students, that's going to be a game or a recycling app to help tell other people where they can find recycling bins on campus. But if you're picking up a new language, the best way is to program something that's interesting to you. I use full applications. That's one reason I start with whole examples in the book is uh, my sons didn't want to learn line by line what every line meant until they saw that it could do something really cool. Then when they were able to start with a full program, they were able to pick it apart and uh, they were able to understand what each of those lines do. It's kind of like as kids, we all like to take things apart and put them back together. Uh, start with an application that's interesting to you and then take it apart, build it, and uh, you'll come out with a lot more understanding of how to program in general, but you'll pick up a new language along the way. Okay, there you have it, Selene. Thank you again, uh, Bryson. We have another one. Well, this is not a question. It's more of a comment okay. by Steve Pearson. Yeah, he says, uh, I am also a member of the Teach Your Kids to Code on Udemy, and it's awesome. So oh, okay. that's you start getting rave, rave reviews here. Thank Keep you, the good Steve. Work. That is great. I appreciate the comment. That means a lot. Um, now I've been teaching for almost 20 years, 17-plus uh, years here at the university, and it still feels great to hear that somebody's enjoying the class. So thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And he also says, keep up the good work. I will tell my friends about it. I'll keep you in touch with you on Twitter. So, uh, which leads me in oh, sure. to, uh, would you mind sharing your, your, um, your Twitter handle and uh, oh, for, the, for the audience? Yes, it's just Bryson Payne, B-R-Y-S-O-N-P-A-Y-N-E. In fact, I can switch back to a screen share one more time. I'll show that last slide. Mm -hmm. It's got my contact info on there as well. You can find the Teach Your Kids to Code site, and I'm just at Bryson Payne on Twitter. There you have it. Easy as his name. So Bryson Payne on Twitter. There you go. All right. Excellent. Okay. Now we have one more question here. Um, let's see. He was asked by, by a guy that I know. I think the name rings a bell. I think it's Nearsoft. <laughs> oh, yeah. Someone are Nearsoft. Okay. It's a good crew, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, yes. Awesome. Okay. Question is, what do you tell, a par what do you tell parents who say, Oh, but I don't know programming. What do you tell them? You know, well, that's a that can be question. Uh, in fact, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons I had uh, several people review my book before it even went through the publisher. I uh, worked with kids. Uh, I had a technical reviewer from uh, uh, Stanford University give it a try. I really wanted to make sure that the examples that I was using were simple enough for a parent to understand. In fact, that's what uh, my uh, publisher 
put on the back cover of the book here. I'll hold that up. Programming so easy a parent can do it. <laughs> I, uh, okay. I thought that was a, a pretty good description. Um, Regardless of what we were after, we wanted to uh, come up with examples that are visual, that are rich, that are short, uh, that are non-threatening. That's why I start with five to ten line programs. It's not just for the kids, it's for the parents as well. Um, that's regardless of the right you yes. know uh, it's a fair uh it's a it i can understand why people are afraid uh you just need to know your kids are probably going to pick it up faster than you so they'll take off but that's a great thing to see and uh, just sitting down with them i find that usually my kids just want to spend time with me they're younger so they still think daddy's cool but <laughs> we uh we enjoy just spending time together but uh, just taking an interest in something that your kids are interested in is a great step toward helping them learn something new as well. Okay, let's see if I have something else here. Uh, okay, well, it's really uh, not questions, uh, but here on in our internal Skype, we have just sure. people expressing their interest in purchasing, purchasing the book. So guys, you already know where to find it uh, on Amazon. And that's, like I said, that's a good way to redeem your gift cards, by the way. <laughs> yes. All right, let's see. I think I have someone here. Uh, yes. He's one of my coworkers from Nearsoft. Okay, yes. The question, his question does, does not show here on the prompt because he's asking this on Skype. Sure. Let, me read it, let me read it back to you. His name is Filiberto Cota. He's working out of the uh, uh, Hermosillo offices here oh, way, way up north. Yeah. And Filiberto's question is, Mm, what is the recommended age for kids to read the book and take the Udemy course? Hmm. All right. If they're going to work alone, I typically recommend that uh, parents start around eight or nine. Before that, it's a little hard to follow the book. Uh, they need to be able to read well, of course, if they're working alone. If you're working with your kids, I started writing the book with Max and Alex when they were two and four years old. So that was uh, a little over three years ago that we started working on this. Um, that's where I got all the ideas for the really cool visual programs was Alex and Max would say, uh, could we do this? Could we make it more colorful? Can we make it draw on more of the screen? And that's what I would do. So uh, I don't think it's ever too young to start. As soon as they're able to hit a few keys on the keyboard and sit in your lap and focus for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, that's a great time to start showing them some code. And if you're an IT professional yourself, then it's something that you can share of what you do in your day job with your kids. Um, that makes it a lot of fun. Uh, for kids that want to learn on their own, around eight or nine years old, uh, third or fourth grade is a good time to start picking up uh, the book and programming by themselves. I find that a lot of uh, middle schoolers really enjoy. Uh, they dig in around sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade. Um, here in the States, uh, so around 12 years old, they can take off. I started coding when I was 12 years old, and I sold my first program by the time I was 14. 14, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you certainly started uh, early. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I, I, I sometimes I kind of wondering, I mean, how do people, how do developers, I, I've been working with, uh, with engineers for, for, for quite a few years now, and uh, it always amazes me what they can achieve and can accomplish. I mean, but, but now when you're talking about a little kid that can start coding at, you know, it's, it's one of those situations where I think, what I say to myself, this little kid is doing things that I cannot, that I will never be able to do, probably, right? So that's what amazes me. Uh, but I, I think, it, does it take some, um, that, that, that would be my question to you as, uh, as this would be, like I, I guess my my only question today would be: uh, Do you think it? Do you think it? A uh, kid needs to be somehow gifted, so to speak, or has had uh, must have some kind of special personality traits in order to become successful as a young developer? Okay, so how, do you think that is really uh, the case, or anyone can do it? What would you say? Well, I think that we should give everybody the chance to learn how to code, uh, but it definitely helps if a student has an aptitude or an interest for problem solving. The cool thing is uh, computer science or information technology is not all coding, but it is all problem solving. Um, we learn how to solve problems on networks. We learn how to solve problems in security. 
Uh, coding just happens to be a really cool way that we can do things in uh, a simple written language and see it uh, either on our mobile device, on our desktop, on our laptop, or on our tablet. So it's, um, I, I think it helps if they're interested, <laughs> just like anything else we want to learn, um, if they really want to pick it up. But anybody who likes to take things apart and put them back together, and I think that's most of us, anybody who likes to solve problems or be able to do new things, and I think that's pretty universal. Um, some kids love the coding part itself and take off, but uh, even a student who's going to grow up to be something completely different can use coding in any line of work. Um, I, I think the sky's the limit. I'd love to see every kid have a chance to learn how to program. That's really why I wrote the book. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's going to be a huge contribution. So we're going to set our sights on um, getting the word out and uh, trying to uh, just have as many people here on this side of the border uh, to get the, to get the book on Amazon. Actually, we are, I think we already have Amazon here in Mexico, so that's that, that's going to be a good a good thing. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Okay, um, Bryson, we're approaching the final minutes of uh, this um, broadcast. So, if you could, if you care to share the final word or a few comments, suggestions, you know, whatever it is. Uh, it's your space, so feel free and write, uh, and uh, the mic's all yours. I appreciate it, Carlos. Well, thank you again for having me on uh, the Dojo Live today. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks to the audience for some great questions. Uh, the last things I would say to you is just uh, imagine what could happen if we show our kids how to solve problems using technology. That's what coding is. It's solving problems in a new way using new tools. Uh, you mentioned uh, these kids are going to be able to do things that we never thought of. Well, that's what we hope for every new generation. We want them to be able to do things better than we did it, to leave the world a better place than they found it. And uh, I think technology is one really powerful way that we can multiply our effort and show kids that they can take things um, into their own hands and solve problems in their own way. I always tell my students to try to solve more problems in the world than they create. As humans, <laughs> even when we're not trying, we create problems, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's waste that we create to just in our daily lives or traffic or congestion. Uh, if they can come up with ways to solve more problems than we create accidentally, um, I think we can be intentional about making the world a better place. And technology is just one way to do it, but it's a really powerful way to take a little bit of effort and spread it all around the world. There you go. I think uh, what we, uh, what you just said and uh, w what we as a company are trying to accomplish, we're definitely on the same wavelength, so to speak. Oh, that is great. I appreciate okay. the time today. I love what Nearsoft's doing with the dojo. Oh, th well, thank you, Bryson, for your willingness and your time. And we'll look forward to having you in the further uh, broadcast. And by the way, you and I are going to be in touch. So we'll be sending you quite soon a, a small couple of tokens of appreciation on the through mail. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So again, Bryson, really uh, from behalf of myself and uh, Nearsoft, uh, again, thank you so much, and please keep in mind that this uh, this uh, broadcast is going to be recorded and uploaded to our channels, um, so you can share them with uh, at, at, at will, and uh, it'll you can reference them back to to your own work. So, um, thank you again. We're going to finalize the the broadcast today. Thank you so much again, and we'll be in touch. Thank you, audience. Thank you, audience. Absolutely. Goodbye.